let's shift our focus back to one of my favorite topics on the Katie Fang Show. If you've been watching me for a while now, you know. It's the Thomases. Clarence and Jenny Thomas, to be exact, the Supreme Court justice and his conspiracy theorist wife, who still believes the 2020 election was stolen two years later. She's so sure of it, in fact, that she repeated the claim to the 1-6 committee in an interview just last month, according to the committee's chairman, Congressman Benny Thompson. She also says she didn't talk to her husband about any of her, quote, post-election activities also known as her text messages to then White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, telling him to encourage Donald Trump to not concede the election to Joe Biden. Ginny also pushed lawmakers in Wisconsin and Arizona to reject election results, but I digress. Don't forget, Justice Thomas was the only justice to dissent in the decision to reject Trump's bid to withhold documents from the 1-6 committee. And it keeps getting worse. This week, Clarence Thomas temporarily froze a lower court order requiring Senator Lindsey Graham to testify under oath in the investigation into Trump and his allies working to overturn the election in Fulton County, Georgia. As Vanity Fair sums it up, Clarence Thomas bails Lindsey Graham out of testifying against Trump because, of course, he does. Now, that's a temporary stay for now, but the Supreme Court could actually rule on this case in its entirety. On Thursday, prosecutors in Georgia told the Supreme Court protecting Lindsey Graham could seriously disrupt their investigation. I have been sounding the alarm bells on the Thomases for a long time, but I'm not the only one. There's a growing list of prominent organizations calling for a congressional investigation into this darling duo. Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, also known as CREW, is the latest group to chime in. They sent a formal letter to both the House Judiciary Committee and the Senate Judiciary Committee voicing their concerns and demanding an investigation into both of the Thomases. The letter reads, Crew respectfully requests that you continue this investigation so that you can assess each individual's continued fitness for federal office and consider legislation to establish binding ethics rules for justices on the United States Supreme Court. Joining me now to talk about, you know, all of that and more is Ian Milheiser. He's a senior correspondent for Vox. He's also the author of The Agenda, How a Republican Supreme Court is Reshaping America. Ian, I'd love to have you on one day when it's not all doom and gloom, but we're really dystopian these days. So let's start off with this. Let's manage some expectations straight out of the gate, Ian. How possible do you think it is? that an investigation will actually begin into either Clarence Thomas, Jenny Thomas, or both of them? I mean, there may be an investigation, but what's it supposed to do? You, you know, the only way to remove mm. a Supreme Court justice is through impeachment. It takes 67 votes in the Senate to, you know, have a successful impeachment trial. And that means right now you would need 17 Republicans to vote to remove the most conservative member of the Supreme Court. I see no set of circumstances when that happens. You, you, you know, Cl Clarence Thomas could go on TV and eat a live baby. And I could, couldn't imagine there being 17 Republicans who think that he should be removed from office and replaced by a, a Joe Biden nominee. So Ian Politico has some new reporting about potential conflicts of interest involving other justices' spouses, specifically Barrett and Roberts' husband and wife, respectfully. So putting aside impeachment, as the Supreme Court does become more politicized, how can these conflicts of interest truly be kept in check? Sheldon Whitehouse, for example, has suggested making sure that you actually have rules of ethics so that the Supreme Court doesn't govern and police itself. Yeah. So, I mean, there are ethical rules. I mean, there's one statute dealing with recusal that does apply to the Supreme Court, although, you know, there's no consequence if a justice violates it. There are ethical rules that apply to lower court judges and that don't apply to the justices. I mean, in the case of Clarence Thomas, there's a, a really strong argument that under existing law, um, he should recuse from at least some cases involving the January 6th investigation, involving Trump's efforts to overrun, overturn the election, because there, there's evidence that his wife was also involved in the efforts to overturn the election. But the problem is, like, you know, there's already a statute that applies to Supreme Court justices, which says that in certain circumstances they need to recuse. There is no 
consequence. And so the question is, you know, how do you impose a consequence? You know, other states, you know, you may remember several years back, Alabama Chief Justice Roy Moore, who was removed from his position or at least from his job responsibilities twice. And the reason why is that Alabama has basically a separate body, separate from the Supreme Court, that can evaluate when it, state Supreme Court justices engage in really bad behavior and impose consequences on them. You could conceive of such a body existing at the federal level. But again, like absent something that can say to Clarence Thomas, sir, you are wrong and there needs to be some consequence here, you know, it doesn't matter what the rules are because there's no way to enforce them. So let's stay down south. We were just talking about Alabama. Let's talk about Georgia. You have some brand new reporting about Senator Lindsey Graham's efforts to evade testifying in the Fulton County investigation. You lay out different paths that Graham could attempt to take, saying Graham's strongest argument is that the Constitution speech and debate clause, which provides that members of Congress shall not be questioned in any other place for any speech or debate in either house, shields him from being called to testify. So, Ian, do you think that's a legit argument for him to raise in this case? The lower court has already said, we respect speech and debate clause. You won't be asked about the stuff that's legitimately related to your work as a legislator. But things like, fi you know, helping find those votes and trying to overturn the election, that doesn't sound like that was a part of his job as a United States senator. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, I think the lower courts handled this case really well. And I will point out that two of the Court of Appeals judges that have heard this case are Trump appointees. So, like, I think that the two Trump judges that signed off on, you know, the lower court's decisions did a good job with it. Um, so what the law says, what the speech and debate clause provides is that a lawmaker can't be forced to testify about the things that they do related to actual lawmaking. So, you know, if there's a bill that Lindsey Graham did or did not vote on, he can't be hauled in front of a grand jury and be asked, why did you vote the way that you did on this bill? But many of the things that Lindsey Graham is accused of have nothing to do with lawmaking. You know, he, he is accused, for example, of calling up the Georgia Secretary of State and potentially trying to pressure the Secretary of State to find some additional votes for Donald Trump or to toss out some absentee ballots. I mean, these are still allegations at this point. We need to hear his testimony. We need to know what actually happened there. But you know, pressuring the, the head election official in the state of Georgia to change votes is not a legislative act. It has nothing to do with his role voting for legislation as a senator. And so that is not protected by the speech and debate clause. That's what the lower courts held. The lower courts, I think, were right. And I hope that the Supreme Court just stays out of this case because, you know, the lower courts handled it well. There's no need for the Supreme Court to get involved here. Yeah, and before we move on, just so our viewers are reminded, Justice Thomas may have entered the temporary stay, but it doesn't even mean that the entire Supreme Court ends up listening to the whole thing anyway. Um, so he could summarily or the Supreme Court could summarily say we're not even going to take this up from Lindsey Graham. So I want to move a little bit farther north with you, Ian. Come along on the journey. We're still in the south. Um, let's talk about North Carolina. As we have warned our viewers before, with you, in fact, there's one particularly concerning case the Supreme Court is expected to take up in December, Moore versus Harper. People are talking about the case a lot. Moore versus Harper could essentially change how our democracy functions. There's a perspective piece in the Washington Post that says, quote, the stakes of this case couldn't be higher. A decision in favor of the North Carolina legislators would essentially allow elected representatives to make whatever laws they want about elections. It would also give them license to ignore any state laws in setting the rules for elections. Ian, as we get closer to the November midterms, are you even more concerned now about this case? And the reason why I peg it around the November midterms for you, Ian, is because of the group of people that may come into office as a result of those elections. Yeah, I mean, I am in a perennial state of low-level terror about this case. What this case seeks to do is essentially remove all of the voting rights protections that exist under state law and state constitutions and say that 
a state legislature can do whatever it wants with respect to federal elections. You know, the Wisconsin legislature is very gerrymandered. Under this lawsuit, it could potentially just give Wisconsin's, um, or under the theory advanced by the plaintiffs in this lawsuit, it could potentially give all of Wisconsin's electoral votes to Donald Trump, and there'd be nothing that could be done. You couldn't sue to challenge that under the state constitution. Potentially, the governor couldn't veto the law just giving those those electoral votes to Donald Trump. So this is very very, very scary. I am slightly more optimistic than I was a week or two ago. And the, the reason for that is because a lot of conservative luminaries have now weighed into the case and just said, please don't do this. This isn't something you want to touch Supreme Court. I mean, people like Judge Michael Ludig, who 15 years ago when I was applying for judicial clerkships was the guy you wanted to clerk for if you were a Republican. You know, uh, Stephen Calbrizi, who's the co-chair of the Federalist Society's board of directors, has weighed in and said, this isn't something you want to touch. You know, there, there is an organization that represents all of the chief justices of every state Supreme Court, they weighed in and said, don't do this, guys. So, I mean, this Supreme Court has done a lot of crazy things. I hope if they won't listen to me that they'll listen to someone like a Stephen Calabrese or a Michael Ludig, because it's just a really bad idea what they're being asked to do here. Yeah, and Ian, to your point, the bipartisan support of making sure that there is no independent state theory when it comes to being able to govern what happens in these elections is what's giving you maybe a little bit of relief. But I guess we're just going to have to wait to see what happens during oral arguments in December. Ian Milheiser, thank you so much for joining our show. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much, Katie.